Well, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. I'm very pleased to uh, present this work, which is one aspect of uh, what we are trying to do in our institute. And uh, this presentation will be focused on uh, uh, individual connectome-based whole brain modeling. And uh, what I'm trying to uh, show you today is that maybe that could be one path among many towards uh, personalized medicine. So the outline of the presentation is the following. First, uh, we are going to briefly see why whole brain modeling uh, may be important and uh, why for personalized medicine. Then I will present the virtual mouse brain, TVMB. And then I will show you the, the results that we have uh, recently obtained uh, using the virtual mouse brain approach, uh, showing that uh, individual structural connectome uh, is a good predictor of functional connectome, which is a prerequisite for a whole brain modeling approaches in personalized medicine. And finally, I will uh, show you an ongoing uh, clinical trial, which is called EPINOV, which makes use of the uh, virtual epileptic patient, also based on whole brain modeling for personalized uh, medicine, this time applied to humans. So why whole brain modeling and personalized medicine? Well, of course, when you have uh, brain disorders, uh, if drugs fail to control these brain disorders, you have to uh, imagine other therapeutic interventions. And uh, for brain tumors or um, uh, drug refractory epilepsy, uh, one solution for the patient is uh, brain surgery. Now, when you do brain surgery, uh, you may you want to identify the uh, zone in epilepsy, for example, which is responsible for seizure genesis and propagation. But if you identify it, you don't want also to produce uh, side effects with the patient. So it would be nice before doing any intervention to uh, know exactly what needs to be done and to predict possible side effects. Of course, now there are uh, uh, techniques which are less invasive, uh, like uh, laser ablation. And you can even uh, try to uh, cut major uh, fiber pathways instead of uh, doing um, neurosurgery by removing uh, whole brain portions. But the question is the same, uh, where to act and how to predict the consequences of uh, the surgery. The same concept applies to uh, deep brain stimulation. We can introduce electrodes in the brain to try to control uh, its activity, uh, for example, uh, for Parkinson. But then the stimulation parameters must be tailored uh, to each patient. And basically, the approach is purely empirical. We try a few things in the clinic and see whether it works or not. It would be nice to know whether we can implement one electrode in one brain region and to know how to stimulate it to produce an effect. And the same concept also applies to non-invasive technologies like um, TMS or uh, now um, uh, ultrasound techniques used to activate brain regions or temporal in interference with the electric fields. So the, the, the major idea behind that is that we would like uh, to define uh, the target region, uh, where to intervene, know how to set the parameters when we have to stimulate the brain, for example, at which frequency, uh, which amplitude of the stimulation, uh, which intensity, sorry. And of course, and as importantly as the, two, the previous two, predict the outcome, predict the success rate, and also predict the side effects. Now, it's very difficult to predict an effect uh, when you want to intervene uh, in a neuronal network. And I'm going to show you a result that was uh, recently uh, published by uh, another group, which perfectly illustrates uh, the difficulty. You all know about optogenetics. Um, now we can have neurons, specific neuron types, expressing uh, here channel rhodopsin. Okay, the protein is expressed when you flash blue light, then the neuron is depolarized and fires action potential. So you can make a specific cell fire an action potential with light. Okay. Now, if you try to think how to control brain regions with optogenetics, you can use what you know about the brain architecture. For example, here in the cortex, 
a very simplified uh, cartoon of the organization, you have a pyramidal cell here, which is glutamatergic, cytatory, and here a GABA neuron, which is a basket cell here, which releases GABA and is supposed to inhibit the uh, pyramidal cell by, uh, with a very strong effect because it makes many synapses there. Okay, so you have an hypothesis that this region is epileptic. You want to prevent the pyramidal cell to fire an action potential. So you want to activate the basket cell so that it inhibits this pyramidal cell. So these uh, scientists uh, did the experiment. They used the opsin, the channel rhodopsin. They placed them in the basket cell. They wanted to stimulate it with light and to inhibit this cell. Below, what happened is that when they activate with light the basket cell, it decreases its firing. Why? Because when you activate the basket cell, first it is activated, but then there is a very complex network effect that in the end feeds back onto the basket cell and inhibits it. So you had an hypothesis, I'm going to excite this cell and produce an effect. But in fact, the effect that you see is not the result of the excitation of the basket cell, but of its inhibition. They could determine that in this paper by using modeling. And with the modeling approach, they could explain the effect. So you can have a bright idea based on what you think you know about brain. But if you don't take into account the complexity of the brain circuitry, it's very difficult really to predict a given effect when you do an intervention in the brain. Now imagine that at the whole scale level, at the whole brain level, where you have a brain with connections, these are the uh, synaptic, the main synaptic pathways that link different brain regions. Okay, you can determine in these human brain modules, functional modules, but if you zoom in, you will find that these big modules are organized in sub-modules. And if you zoom again, you will have a voxel architecture with many complicated uh, synaptic pathways linking these different voxels, these submodules, and the modules together. Now, let's say that you want to stimulate one voxel, then it's becoming very difficult, based on the previous argument, to predict the effect that you will get. This is one reason why one possibility to try to predict uh, the result of an intervention in the brain is to use large scale brain networks. And uh, Victor Girsa, uh, the head of the Institute, is one of the founder of the virtual brain, which is a uh, free access online platform, which you can uh, use to virtualize uh, brains. It's part of the human brain project now. And it's quite straightforward. First, you get the anatomy of the brain, which is unique to individuals with all the regions, and you get a parcellation for the different brain regions that you want to investigate. Then you get DTI, so the synaptic uh, connections, the, sorry, the, the axonal pathways, the main axonal pathways that you can uh, obtain with diffusion, diffusion imaging. And so you can link all your nodes or your voxels uh, with each other according to the existence or not of uh, connection, the synaptic connections in between them. Then uh, what you do is to introduce for each node a model that will generate some kind of activity. And then you see what is happening at the whole brain level, uh, which generates a kind of a pattern activity that you can relate to EG signal or um, fMRI signal or MEG signal. In that kind of model, of course, the connectome, which region is connected to which region, is a key parameter. And time delays also are very important. So the future, uh, the idealized version of the future, would be the following. You have an individual with a brain disorder. You construct an avatar of the patient's brain by scanning the patient's brain to obtain anatomical information and the connectome, the structural connectome. And then after you have virtualized the patient's brain, then you can test interventions in silico because you can do anything you want with the computer and predict possible effects. 
you can evaluate the risks of a given intervention and the side effects. And then, ideally, you would perform the predicted intervention. However, right now, there are very few interventions which are allowed in patients. For example, if you try to implement a deep brain stimulator somewhere else than the region authorized right now, it's going to be extremely difficult because you will have to validate your approach and justify your approach. But there are two main questions that uh, need to be answered before we get to this idealized future. The first question is how good whole brain modeling is. If we want to have a good predicting value, then the modeling must be uh, faithfully uh, reproducing the reality. And uh, how good are the predictions? Can we really predict uh, the desired effect? And can we predict the possible side effects? This is why right now the mouse approach uh, we think is a necessary step for validation of all these aspects. And this is why now I'm going to introduce the virtual mouse brain. Why? Because in the mouse, that's the advantage as compared to humans, we can test hypotheses even in the same mouse. So you, we can scan a mouse, virtualize its brain and make predictions and verify these predictions uh, experimentally something that we cannot do uh, in humans uh, right now. So what is the virtual mouse brain? See, this is the work of a brilliant uh, PhD student, Francesca Melozzi, who introduced in the virtual brain platform, which was uh, for humans originally, but ad adapted it for the mouse. But the idea is es essentially the same. You get the anatomical image of an individual mouse, you create a parcellation and you reconstruct the different regions you are interested in. Then you get structural data, which connection, which region is connected to which region. So you get the structural connectome. And with this, you create a brain avatar of this mouse, of this mouse and then you generate um, uh, some uh, electrical signals that you can transform into bolt signal and you get functional uh, data in silico that you can compare to the functional data that you have also acquired in the same mouse, but now experimentally. But basically, this is the same thing uh, that has been done for many years in the virtual brain. So again, you get the parcellation in the human brain. We will see that later for the virtual epileptic patient. We get tracer, uh, sorry, the DTI data for uh, the structural connectome we model the, the brain and we generate a neuronal activity uh, to obtain a bolt signal in that case. Okay, but here uh, we all know that there are problems with the uh, structural connectomes, which is not very precise. We cannot resolve long range connections. Now, if the, uh, the fiber pathways are torturous, it's very difficult also to resolve them. There are many uh, problems with, uh, with ETI, which is not as precise as uh, we would like it to be. We have to make another approximation to generate neuronal activity because we cannot model a whole uh, network with all the neurons, the different types of neurons and the glial cells and uh, blood vessels. So we have to simplify it. So we have to make approximations, one very important approximation is the model that is used to generate electrical activity in each region in the computer model. So my uh, mom told me there are three things I should not do in public. The third thing is to show mathematical equations. So this is the model that we are using, which is called the reduced Wang Wang model. This is a classical model which has been adapted because originally there were uh, 7,000 to 100,000 equations. And of course, for each voxel, you cannot use that many equations. And it was reduced to two equations. And this is just to show you that, yeah, we can write uh, the, the equations that can describe a neuronal activity for each uh, node in the network. Uh, Mom, this is just the same equation, so don't hit me. With these equations, then you can vary some parameters to generate some kind uh, of activity that you're interested in. 
And there is a value for some uh, parameters which uh, result in a bistable regime, which means that the regions go up and down, up and down, which is what you see when you record um, fMRI, resting state fMRI. This ensures that uh, you can see whole brain dynamics, an evolution in time of uh, what the regions are doing. And this model enables that kind of behavior. So now, what are we going uh, to measure? With that kind of uh, connectome-based uh, model, and with that kind of uh, generative model for our electrical activity, then we can study a brain uh, dynamics. Because with this kind of system in a huge brain, the brain is going to explore uh, different attractors and can switch from one attractor to the next. And in fact, you can uh, recover that way uh, the functional networks uh, which have been uh, identified uh, experimentally in humans. And you can characterize functional connectivity during resting state. So you can find also the resting state networks in silico with that kind of simulation. And there is a multistability, uh, which is important to reproduce this dynamical regime of the functional connectivity. So what is this uh, uh, dynamical evolution of the functional connectivity? This is, these are examples of bold signals uh, which are uh, generated, but they would look the same uh, in vivo. And you can take, uh, so this is a uh, time, you can take a time window here. And in this time window, you look at all the signals from all the brain regions that uh, you're uh, stimulating or um, uh, recording experimentally. And you can calculate the correlation of one signal in one region with the signal in another region. Now, if the correlation is super high, it's dark red. And low, it's minus one, no correlation, zero. And you can correlate for the 90 brain regions considered here, one region during this window with another region, which you can read here at the intersection of these two uh, regions. And if the correlation is high, then you can say that, well, the, 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 these brain regions cooperate uh, somehow. Then you slide the window and a little bit later, the map is totally different. The regions are correlated to one another, but in a different manner. Sometime later, another map appears and another one appears later. This shows that functional connectivity evolves in time. You can make the average over a 30 minute uh, period of recording in humans. And this is the map that you will obtain that tells you how much a brain region is correlated to another brain region during a 30 minute period. Like for example, here in red, you will have these regions here highly correlated during the whole duration of the recording. But this static functional connectivity does not take into account the dynamics, because you can clearly see that from one window to the next, we get a different functional connectivity map. This you can illustrate with functional connectivity dynamics map. This time you remove all the regions. What you are interested in is to calculate how much one frame, one functional connectivity frame, is correlated to the next. In, now the map runs in time, two time dimension, and when you see a square, it means that this one is stable. The next square is, well, this one is stable during, let's say, five minutes, et cetera, et cetera. So when you see squares along the diagonal, it means that the system is stable during a certain period of time, and then it switches to another uh, functional connectivity map. This taking into account the dynamics of functional connectivity, but you lose the information about which regions cooperate with which region. OK, so I will come back to that uh, later, because we have to find uh, a metric to measure what we are going to do. Now, another uh, difficulty when you use uh, structural uh, connectomes based on DTI is that there is no gold standard. Of course, we would like to have a gold standard for the human connectome, because as I said, the uh, structural connectome that is obtained with DTI is a very uh, approximate version of the reality in a patient. 
But the gold standard uh, already exists uh, in mice. This has been done uh, by the Allen Institute. And what they did was to inject tracers in hundreds of mice. And with these tracers, they could reconstruct the axonal pathway from any brain region to any other brain region. Of course, here you lose the individual nature of the connectome. But this is as best a gold standard as we can obtain because now the, the tracer gives us very, very detailed information about the connections between different regions, even different layers uh, of the cortex with other region. So very precise, but the caveat is that it's an average of hundreds of different mice. But at least we get all the connections. So what we did was to import this uh, data set from the Allen Institute into the virtual brain to build a virtual Allen brain, which will be our gold standard, very detailed. And this is what we did first to validate the uh, TVMB, the virtual mouse brain. And we can import structural connectivity from the Allen Institute or from uh, DTI obtained uh, from mice. We can reconstruct in silico these brains, so the Allen brain or a real mouse. And we have the generative model that produces bolt signal. And then we can calculate like the functional connectivity dynamics or the functional connectivity uh, maps average on 30 minutes. And when we did that, we uh, looked at whole brain dynamics and we could find the same features that are uh, found and recorded experimentally in mice with some regimes and the activation of specific resting state networks. In vivo, experimental hubs have been identified. So regions which are very important for the exchange of information. And when we looked at in silico with the same type of analysis, there was a very nice correspondence between the functional hubs in silico with the functional hubs found experimentally without any mani specific manipulation. It was just emerging from the structural connectome. We did another test for this uh, virtual brain platform for mice. We have a structural connectivity matrix and we can try to mimic epilepsy in it. So we choose a region which will start a seizure and the mathematical models which are present in the platform enable to generate that kind of uh, epileptic activity and mimic its propagation. So by just seeding the onset zone with uh, a seizure, we could see how it propagated in the whole brain. And a paper has been published uh, in an experimental model of epilepsy in rodents with many recording sites in different brain regions and we looked at the correspondence between this experimental data and the simulated data, and we found a very nice uh, correspondence for the propagation pattern, which means that by just knowing the structural connectome, uh, we could uh, reproduce the propagation pattern of seizures, which were found experimentally, which was a kind of uh, interesting validation for uh, our approach. So th in this first part, I showed you that we could extend the version of TVB, the virtual brain, to the mouse brain to enable whole brain modeling in mice by virtualizing the mouse brain and by using the Allen connectome, which is tracer-based, as our gold uh, standard. We provided the proof of concept that mouse brain dynamics was quite relevant to the experimental condition because we could find resting state activity as uh, experimentally in mice in a healthy condition, but also in pathological conditions, in particular in epilepsy for our seizure propagation. So that was um, uh, very good for us because that justified uh, our approach. And uh, then we could start to think about the big questions that we wanted to ask. Again, our long-term goal is to apply all these techniques for a personalized medicine in patients. But first, the major question that we wanted to ask, the first one that I presented you, is how good 
is whole brain modeling to uh, evaluate, to mimic the uh, reality. Because this whole brain modeling is based on the structural connectome. And if you want to do personalized medicine, it is first important to determine whether the individual structural connectome constrains the functional connectome in individual mice. And this is uh, the paper that was published uh, less than a year ago, where we investigated this feature uh, in uh, the virtual mouse brain. For, for this, we teamed up with uh, Eyal Bergman, brilliant also PhD student of Itamar Khan uh, in the Technion Institute in Israel, and also with uh, Julie Harris um, at the Allen Institute. So what Eyal did was to uh, uh, obtain structural data from 19 mice and also uh, fMRI from the same uh, mice. Uh, all these signals were uh, obtained uh, in non-anesthetized animals. They were head fixed uh, in the MRI machine and there were several sessions during several days. So the same mouse was scanned uh, upon multiple days. And so we had a big data set of uh, 19 mice. And for each, we had the structural connectome and the functional connectome. Then we had to decide which metric we were going to use to characterize and to compare the uh, experimental and the theoretical um, uh, functional connectivity. So between in silico and experimental. As I said, the functional connectivity matrix gives you an idea of uh, which region cooperates with which region. But for this, we have to average uh, the whole thing over here for mice, 20 minute uh, recording period. Or we could look at smaller uh, time windows and slide them along the signal. And for each window, we would get a functional connectivity map. And then some methods have been developed like the functional meta connectivity. I won't detail it, but you can characterize the dynamics of these uh, functional connectivity a long time. So first we wanted to test whether one was better than the other. What we found surprisingly is that uh, when you look at the correlation for each mouse and for each uh, recording session, how one recording session within a given mouse correlates in the same mouse to another recording session, we found a very nice correlation close to uh, one for the regression line, which means that a session in a given mouse is a very good predictor of, uh, of another session in the same mouse. Now, if we compare across mice for each of these runs, then we get a much lower uh, uh, reproducibility. So the main correlation across sessions within the mouse is quite high as compared to intersubject correlation. So the functional connectome is a good fingerprint uh, of uh, the mouse brain, which is also uh, um, in keeping with what has been published previously in the literature. When we tried to do that uh, with the functional connectivity dynamics, then it didn't work. The best result was obtained uh, with um, this uh, static functional uh, connectivity map, not the dynamic one. So we kept the uh, functional connectivity for the rest of the study. Now the strategy was the following. For each of the 19 mice, we had the structural connectome and we built 19 uh, avatars for uh, these mice. We simulated the bolt signal and for each of the mice, we obtain a functional connectivity map. So 19 of them. At the same time, we had the data from these mice in the MRI, so the experimental fMRI data, and we constructed similarly the functional connectivity map from these 19 mice, and we could compare one-to-one -one the prediction with the experimental data. And we used the tracer from the Allen Institute, the tracer data to have our gold standard. And again, we simulated the bolt signal. We obtain a functional connectivity map that we use to compare with 
uh, experimental and simulated uh, data. And we call the predictive power of a connectome for mouse X, the mean of crossations and animals of the correlation between what is simulated and uh, what is empirical. And with this measure, predictive power, we can test whether the simulated, uh, close the simulated data is from the experimental data for each animal. Then we had to choose between uh, two algorithms to uh, establish our structural connectome. There is a way to extract the connectome using probabilistic cryptography or deterministic cryptography. And you can see that the uh, connectome maps are uh, quite different because they use uh, different uh, ways to calculate the uh, uh, fiber pathways. So this is the uh, predictive power of the intercession for experimental functional connectivity. So you see that it's not one because one given session is not a perfect predictor of another session in the same animal. But still we reach quite a high level of uh, prediction. And this serves our limit, upper limit for the best predictor because this is coming from experimental data. Then we looked at uh, virtualized brains and the bold signal genera uh, generated in silico. And we looked at the difference between the connectome obtained with the probabilistic uh, algorithm versus the deterministic algorithm. And what we could find is that the deterministic algorithm was producing a better predictive power as compared to uh, the probabilistic one. So in our case, the deterministic cryptography produces a structural collectome, which has a better predictive power at the individual mass level as compared to the probabilistic cryptography. So we use uh, deterministic diffusion MRI to construct uh, the um, avatars of the mice. Now the question is how good <clears throat> is the individual connectome? So for this, we use average connectomes. So we averaged the 19 connectomes from the 19 mice. We generated uh, uh, theoretical bolt signal and we compared these values to the individual values. It turns out that the average connectome, of course, is uh, worse in predicting the uh, functional connectome in individual mice. We chose that already with this kind of approach that the individual structural connectome is a better predictor of functional connectome as compared to the average connectome. Right, it's a first step towards uh, the demonstration of a causal link between structure and function. It doesn't demonstrate it, but at least this condition should have been satisfied and it is satisfied. So the struct individual structural connectome is much better than the average connectome, which means that it contains something that is specific to the individual, which can uh, account for uh, the properties of the functional connectome. Now, we all know that DTI has major drawbacks. Among the, these drawbacks is that you cannot identify faithfully the long range connections. And another major drawback is that the connection is bidirectional. However, we know that in the brain, uh, the connections are in most intense instances unidirectional. So how can we investigate the importance of this lack of information for DTI? Well, this is where the tracer connectome, our gold standard, is very important because here we have the long range connections because all connections are labeled or should be labeled. And we know the direction now because the tracer gives us the direction of the connection. So first we used the Allen uh, brain that we constructed in silico. We generated bolt signal and very surprisingly, although this connectome, which is highly detailed, is the average of hundreds of mice, we got a better predictive power as compared to individual connectomes, which means that in this very detailed connectome, there is 
information that is highly relevant to whole brain dynamics, even at the individual level, which is lost when you use DTI. In other words, in DTI, there is information that is critical to explain whole brain dynamics at the individual level, and it's not available. Because we had this gold standard, we could try to understand which information is missing in the DTI. So first, we remove from our gold standard connectome the long range connections. So we filtered uh, the uh, connections and we found that the predictive power was decreasing, but not to the level of individual connectomes. So that means that yes, the long range connections are important, but they do not explain completely the fact uh, that uh, uh, it produces a more relevant uh, dynamic, whole brain dynamic, this uh, Allen connectome. So here, this is, for example, what we did in the uh, barrel field of the uh, somatosensory uh, cortex, primary sensory cortex barrel field. And here in blue, you have the efferent projections from this region, and in yellow, the efferent projections to this region, and these are the connected regions. In the original tracer, you can see that there is indeed a difference between uh, efferent and afferent projections. Uh, DMRI in a, in a mouse, it's bidirectional by definition. So what we did was first to remove the long range connections, but we kept here the directionality. That's what you see here. When you remove the long range connections, then you decrease the predictive power. Now let's render this connectome symmetric and see what happens. When, when you render this connectome symmetric, the Allen connectome, then you totally lose the richness of uh, brain dynamics. And now you drop to the values found in individual connectomes. So the conclusion of this part is that, sorry, directionality is a key player in predicting brain dynamics, which means that if we want uh, to model uh, more efficiently whole brain dynamics using uh, DTI-based connectomes, we must somehow take into account the directionality of uh, the fibers to improve the simulations. But then we wanted to see whether some connections which are not included in the uh, uh, structural connectome obtained with DTI, we're playing a very important role to explain whole brain dynamics in a given mouse. So what we did was take one mouse and then we replaced one after another, a given connection in the structural connectome or given real connection by the connection existing in the Allen Institute connectome. And this is what you see here. And this is the predictive power. And you can see that when you use this region coming from the Allen Institute, instead of the region found in the, the, the mouse, then you increase the predictive power. And some improvements are specific to mice because this one is not found in the other mice. But some regions, appear to play a very important role, whichever the mouse is considered, which means that in the Allen connectome, there is some kind of information that is also critical that is not found in the DTI connectome, even in individual mice. So we have every single uh, region uh, in the brain to see which role was played by a given region. Interestingly, so what you do is to construct each time a hybrid connectome, you have the DTI connectome and you replace one by one the information coming from the Allen brain. Most of the time when you do that, when you replace in an individual brain the connections coming from the Allen connectome, then you lose in predictive power. This is a clear indication that the structural connectome of an individual contains information that is critical for its whole brain dynamics which means that if you replace it by something else, then you lose in predictive power. However, a few regions here, when you replace them 
by the Allen Institute connectome, which is the average of 100 mice. When you replace these regions in each individual mouse, then you dramatically increase the predictive power. These regions are the codopitamen and the anterior cingulate. Here you have axons, very short axons, and they're very difficult uh, to resolve with ETI. In this region, the axons sometimes branch at 90 degrees, and the algorithm is, has a lot of difficulty to resolve that kind of pathway. So not surprisingly, because the connectivity of these regions is poorly resolved with ETI, if you replace it by even on an average connectome, but coming from hundreds of mice, very detailed, then you increase a lot the predictive power of each individual mice. So again, the resolution of the fiber tracks of the anterior cingulate and the codoputamen, if you take them from uh, the Allen Institute, are going to improve a lot your uh, simulations. And in fact, if you take here an individual connectome from an individual mouse, and you replace only one region, usually the anterior cingulate, your hybrid connectome now is as good as the filtered uh, Allen connectome. So you can increase the uh, reliability of your simulations by replacing the connectivities that are fully resolved with DTI. So again, it is a way when constructing that kind of hybrid connectome to improve your simulations. So we were fortunate because we had this gold standard provided by the Allen Institute, but we still don't have that kind of data for uh, the human brain. The best we have is coming from uh, non-human primates, but it's not complete yet. And then we could see also other things which are quite interesting. The role of lateralization uh, in the brain. What we discovered is that the structural connectome, the real structural connectome from individual mice is lateralized. So connections from the right hemisphere are quite different from the left hemisphere for some regions. But the Allen connectome, it was uh, done, the injections were only done in one hemisphere. So to construct the artificial Allen connectome in our simulations, we took the mirror image of the injection which means that the connectome, the Allen connectome in our simulations in, is entirely symmetric. So we looked at the effect of lateralization. And in fact, when we take the mirror image of the left and the right, then we dramatically decrease the uh, amount of predictive power. And then we could identify in the brains of individual mice the region that is most uh, asymmetric in terms of structural connectome in its effect on whole brain dynamic. And again, this is the somatosensory cortex, the supplemental somatosensory cortex. Here, we show the effect of lateralization. And all these points refer to the individual mice and sessions. And they are at the eye end of uh, this graph, which means that if we render these uh, connections symmetric, we lose a lot in terms of uh, predictive power. So when we contacted Julie Harris at the Allen Institute and we told her, look, the, somat the supplemental somatosensory cortex appears uh, really uh, lateralized. They had done injections in the left hemisphere only, so she did the injections in the right hemisphere they sent us the data and we indeed found that there was a strong lateralization of the uh, supplemental somatosensory cortex. So you see an example here that with using uh, that kind of virtual approach, we could make predictions about the real organization of uh, the brain of mice and found experimentally, could prove experimentally these predictions. And this is uh, shown here. If you lose, if you use uh, uh, the left as the left, and if you use the left as the mirror right, then you lose a lot here. If you, uh, if you make it symmetric, you lose a lot in predictive power. But if you use a lateralized version of uh, the supplemental som uh, somatosensory cortex, then you increase the predictive power. 
So the lateralization of the functional connectivity, which is found in all the mice, is supported by the lateralization of the structural connectome uh, in mice. During a long time, there was the dogma that in rodent brain, uh, the right hemisphere was equivalent to the left hemisphere. We are not the first one to show lateralization, but at the whole brain level like this, yes, and we could predict and prove it experimentally. And again, this is another step towards a causal relationship between structure and function. Again, because we predicted it and found it experimentally. So the conclusion of uh, this part is that intramice functional connectivity, it's more stable than the intermice uh, and it provides a good uh, fingerprint that the personal structural connectome predicts the functional connectome in individual mouse and it's significantly better than the group derived structural connectome. The predictions with a deterministic connectome, it's better than when using the probabilistic processed structural connectome. And as I mentioned, the main drawbacks when you use that kind of approach is that you cannot resolve some connections, in particular uh, long uh, fiber tracts and also the directionality. And that play a key role uh, in uh, uh, constraining whole brain functional dynamics. And we found that regions uh, need to be seeded with more information because at least in mouse, they are poorly resolved uh, with DTI. And finally, we found that there was a hemispherical functional lateralization in the brain, which is supported by the anatomical lateralization. So this kind of approach uh, shows you that, yes, we can investigate the relationship between structure and function uh, in uh, individual mice. So what are the next steps? The next steps, uh, this is uh, presently done by Giovanni Rabuffo, postdoc uh, in the lab, is to implement a generative model that allows now the activation and inactivation of specific cell types like uh, excitatory or inhibitory cell in a layer dependent manner because right now the model is uh, on a node. But then we can try now to reconstruct layers in the cortex and add specific, uh, specific cell types. So the, the, the modeling now is, uh, the model is now ready. We are going to prepare a manuscript. And with that kind of model inside TVB, we will be able to start to activate and inactivate specific pathways. And the next step, is to drive brain dynamics to desired modes in individual mice. What we would like to do is to virtualize a mouse brain, design an intervention like stimulation, and to drive the brain into a dynamic regime that we want, like activating the memory network. And finally, what we would like to do is determine in silico which cell we need to control in which region of the brain to obtain an effect and verify the predictions experimentally in the same individual. For example, if you want to tune deep rate stimulation to you, an individual patient, it would be nice to know where to implement the electrode and how to stimulate. And this is a project uh, is ongoing uh, with, again, uh, uh, Victor Giasa and uh, Itamar Khan at Technion and also uh, Jin Lee at Stanford. Strategy is very similar. With optogenetics, now you can control specific ty cell types in specific brain regions. So we are going to uh, virtualize these uh, mice brain. We are going to uh, uh, virtualize their brain, study in silico brain dynamics, and then we will do some parameter fitting to fit with uh, the uh, functional uh, MRI that we obtain. And then we're going to stimulate one region one particular neuron in one region and predict the effect. And these predictions will be uh, tested experimentally in the same animal, which was uh, uh, virtualized to have a personalized approach. Another thing that you can do, we would like to do in the future, is to do longitudinal studies where you acquire DTI and fMRI, for example, during aging. And at each time step, when you uh, acquire this data, you can virtualize the mouse brain and make some prediction of your future events that may occur if, for example, we can see a degradation of the structural connectome. And at each time we compare the uh, predicted 
uh, functional connectome with the uh, experimental connectome. And oh, I spent too much time. Um, so I won't describe it, just what we are doing right now. Uh, we're doing the same thing uh, in humans. So this is the work of Victor Giassa and Fabrice Bartolomei in uh, our lab and hospital. So we have patients with uh, drug-resistant epilepsy. This is a multi-center trial, <clears throat> sorry. We get anatomical data, we get the structural data, and it's the same process. The brain uh, avatar of the patient is constructed. There are generative models that can uh, mimic uh, seizures, for example. This is included in the avatar uh, of the patient. We can refine network uh, topology. If there is a martoma, for example, or lesions already present, we can modify uh, the brain uh, in silico to take that into account. We do data fitting with available EG recordings, for example. And then we have a parameter space exploration. We can start in silico to remove one brain region after another. And the idea is to predict which set of regions need to be removed to uh, cure the patient of course, without uh, strong side effects. And uh, sorry, I'm skipping that. And this is the, the data that uh, led to the clinical trial. They were, uh, this was done retrospectively after virtualized the brain of patients, uh, a, a small series of patients. And we compared the regions that were predicted by the virtual approach with the regions that were effectively uh, removed by the neurosurgeon. This is the angle score. One is the patient is seizure free, two, three, it still has seizures and three is bad. And this is the measurement of the discrepancy between the prediction and uh, the uh, neurosurgical removal. And the larger is the difference, the worse is the angle score. And now the idea is to provide this information to clinicians in the uh, with the multiple arm in this clinical trial. And some clinicians will receive the prediction and they will decide or not to follow it. And we will know in, uh, in, the, in several years whether this information provides valuable information and uh, helps uh, getting a better success of neurosurgery. So final conclusions that structure-based whole brain modeling is not ideal but it may be sufficient to obtain realistic predictions. It has many drawbacks as I show you. And an individual approach is possible with that kind of uh, whole brain modeling for personalized medicine. That's what we hope. The advantage of rodents is that you can predict and test uh, in individual uh, mice or rats. But there is still a lot of work to do. This was just the beginning. First, we had to create uh, the virtual mouse brain. Then we had to show that the structural connectome is sufficient to uh, predict sufficiently well the functional connectome. But then the next steps are now the most important ones, whether we can predict an intervention in an animal, make it, and verify it experimentally. So there are uh, multiple projects uh, going on on this topic, and that uh, three positions opening in Marseille. They are not advertised yet. Two postdocs uh, with this uh, NIH uh, project that we have uh, with Stanford and Technion. And uh, one PhD student, which will be financed by an EU project uh, on an international training program. This is where the lab is located in Marseille. And as a fin final word, don't forget to send your best papers to uh, in Europe. Thank you.